Imagine Jesus giving this parable in Galilee to a very interested group of people. Galilee, Galilee was and is a fertile area surrounded today on the east by the Golan Heights, Syria and Jordan, on the north by Lebanon. To the west is the Mediterranean Sea and to the south is Judah. When you hear Benjamin Netanyahu talk about Samaria, he is talking about Galilee. Galilee is the place where Jesus grew up. It differed from Judah, the site of Jerusalem, Bethlehem, Hebron, and today Tel Aviv in modern times because it was an area with a large non-Jewish population. This is as true today as it was then. The cities today of Tiberias and Nazareth are majority Arab. They were significantly peopled by non-Jews then. So the, the area has many characteristics in common across the centuries. Jesus was speaking, we think, to Galilean Jews. They heard the beginning of the parable, probably a tale known to all of them, and were cheering. Anything done to absentee landowners sounded good to them. Like people without property everywhere, they were resentful of people who had property. They supported any rebellion against the absolute absentee landowners, and they were assuming that Jesus, known to be a radical, was joining them in this rebellion. But he turns the story inside out, and they are appalled. Parables exist to confront, startle, and amaze people. They do not exist to comfort. They exist to make people who are self-assured less assured. The people who heard this parable believed that they were the subjugated people. Instead, Jesus sides with the landowner and rejects the tenants. What did Jesus mean? Was he telling the early Christians that they are the displaced, that they've displaced the Jews? Perhaps. I imagine Jesus re was retelling and allegorizing a popular story about a popular revolt against a landlord. It says that the absentee landlord has rights and the original audience would have been offended by the comparison. How could Jesus use such an action in this way? He could because it grabbed people's attention. The tenants are not the subject of compassion. They are treated harshly for not recognizing their fealty to the landowner. It's an uncomfortable and violent story. The parable functions as an important sign in Matthew that Jesus is more than he seems. If with many we see it as an allegory, then the sending of the slaves means the sending of Moses and the prophets. And the son is, of course, Jesus. This is by no means a settled interpretation, and we'll study it further when we get to it in the Matthew Bible study, which, of course, you're welcome to join Monday mornings at 10, but not tomorrow in McKinsey. We're taking the federal holiday off. As it functions in Matthew, it sets up the powers that be in the Holy Land as concerned that their power is threatened by this pretender announcing that he is the Son of God. It is the feeling of being threatened, the life and fear that I want to focus on today. The authorities in Jerusalem are not looking for Jesus to liberate them from anything. They led comfortable lives and had accommodated themselves to Roman rule. Jesus wasn't preaching sedition, but they feared that he was. They were afraid. As we read on in Matthew, we know that they respond to this fear by crucifying Jesus. This is a violent parable, and it provoked a violent response. Those who heard it knew it was critical of them, and they didn't like it. After all, they had laws, procedures, position, and stability. They feared change. They had good reason to be afraid, but not of Jesus. Assuming for the moment that Jesus told this story in about the year 30, the Romans would end Judaism as they knew it in the year 70, 40 years later with the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. The ending had nothing to do with the Jesus movement. It had to do with Roman power. The authorities, the Jewish authorities, were afraid of the wrong thing. It seems to me that there is no more issue more important today than to discuss here what happened Sunday night in Las Vegas. We live in interesting times. What does this text have to do with our interesting times? The, um, you know, I gave this sermon at 8 o'clock, and one of the people 
responded to it uh, enigmatically, and he said, whenever you talk about gun control, you're talking about politics. The implication was this is not the appropriate place to do that. Um, many of you have known me long enough to know that that argument does not dissuade me. <clears throat> As a country, we have gone through and are going through trying times. We are experiencing fires in the West, Harvey in Texas, Irma in Florida, Maria in Puerto Rico, Nate now hitting the Gulf Coast, and now 58 dead and more than 500 injured in Las Vegas. Natural disasters and a man-made disaster. Then there are horrible disasters in the rest of the world happening daily. Normally about 100 people die needlessly from guns daily. We added another 58 Sunday night. We notice the 58, not the 100. We live in a violent society. What does the gospel have to say, and what would preaching the gospel in this environment say to us? Does the gospel have a clear position on the tragedies we face? I will set aside conversations about the natural disasters, the hurricanes, the earthquake in um, Mexico, and the fires in California, whether man said or not. They were exacerbated and are being exacerbated by global warning, warming. If you want a Christian response to them, give today and give generously to the Episcopal Relief and Development Fund. Many of us remember Sandra Swan. When she was a parishioner here, she was the head of that fund, made it something very much worth giving to. What about gun violence? I've read a lot about it and I have strong opinions. You can probably guess my conclusions. What are we doing by arming ourselves? We've learned that the shooter in Las Vegas needed so many weapons in part because the device he used to make them automatic weapons also caused them to overheat and jam. That's a practical issue. Why do we, I can't get into the shooter's mind, need to arm ourselves so thoroughly? Of what are we afraid? People like me keep talking about gun control and people on the other side talk about the Second Amendment. We have no common ground because perhaps we don't understand why we're having the conversation in the first place. I believe we'll only be able to make progress if we admit to some common ground. In the Gospel this morning, look at the violence. The landowner sends his slaves to collect his rent. They are killed. In the first instance, he sends three. One is beaten, one is killed, we know not how, and the third is stoned to death. It is a violent story. It's in the Bible. So this patient man sends more slaves and they are treated the same way. So this patient man sends his son, believing the tenants will respect his son and heir. They killed him. The landowner's patience is exhausted and we read that he executes the tenants and turns the vineyard over to new tenants. Again, violence. It is clear in my reading that the tenants believed that they were entitled to the produce of the vineyard and the owner was not deserving. Obviously, he disagreed and Jesus comes down on his side. When the representatives of the owner come to collect what is his, the tenants are at least annoyed, perhaps threatened, and certainly non-compliant. They are, after all, special. They deserve what they have. They take action and are apparently surprised that they cannot do so with impunity. They are only defending what is theirs or should be theirs. The arguments around our need to be so heavily armed frequently focus on the need for us to be able to defend ourselves. Of what are we afraid? Obviously not statistics and studies, because statistics and studies show that having a firearm in your home increases the likelihood that you will be a victim of gun violence. Instead, the argument points out that I need to be able to be armed if I'm a Second Amendment supporter in case someone assaults me or someone I love. It doesn't matter that statistics and studies show that being armed doesn't work for defense. Many of us are persuaded that being armed is our constitutional right. Now, a very long time ago, I was trained in the use of firearms. I was a Boy Scout and I got a merit badge for my ability to shoot a 22 and hit the target. I spent a summer at Fort Bragg and qualified as a marksman. 
Now, for those of you who've been in the service, you know that's not a really wonderful achievement, um, sort of entry level. Um, I would have qualified higher, but I fell asleep in the afternoon on the firing range. The night before was the moon landing, and I'd stayed up all night uh, watching that, and I was tired. But I qualified. I haven't handled a firearm since 1969, and giving me one today would, I know, put me and all around me in danger. That, of course, is not the point, and many who are armed are better trained than I would ever hope to be or want to be. A word of caution. I'm not saying that I or my position is any less violent than the position of a strong supporter of the Second Amendment. I have chosen to remain a part of this violent society, so I'm equally culpable for violence simply because I am, by and large, passive in the face of it. I lament it, I will preach against it, and I see it happening all around me, and I go on. I am persuaded by an op-ed piece in this week's New York Times that those supporting gun control are so absolutely and entirely powerless because we support things to be done and not a movement speaking to the fears, concerns of real people. We read and hear that this is not the time to talk about gun-related violence. We heard that after Sandy Hook. We heard that after Columbine. We heard that after Orlando. We will hear that after the next tragedy. When is the time of what are we afraid? The owner of the vineyard sends three delegations into violence and then turns on the tenants. Fortunately, that's a story and not a prescription for action. Of what are we afraid? We read in the Bible that we are loved by God and that nothing we can do will separate us from that love. We hear on Sundays that there is nothing more important to our being than being loved by God and that if we are loved by God, we can face any challenge. Clearly we, at least as a people, don't believe that. Of what are we afraid? I know that any situation I enter into armed will only increase the danger for everyone involved and the likelihood is that I or someone I love will come out injured or killed. That reflects the overwhelming statistics and studies about living life armed. I also know that I am a member of the entitled class and therefore one of those resented by those who own guns. Of what are we afraid? I know that my Redeemer lives, and I trust that he will look out for me, as he did for the 58 people killed in Las Vegas and the hundreds wounded. What does it mean to have a Redeemer who looks out for me when I am the subject of unplanned, unforeseen, unmerited violence? That's the problem of evil in this world. God has said to you and to me that the only argument I have for you is that I love you. Evil convinces us that that is not enough. We need to be afraid. Imagine the life of the new tenants in the vineyard. We can imagine they have the opportunity to be productive and live meaningful lives. The only thing which can destroy those meaningful lives is fear. The only thing which can, that we are here in this church to learn how to live without fear. Bad and horrible things do and will continue to happen. The Holocaust continues to confound anyone who preaches about God's love. The actions of Pol Pot in Cambodia continue to confound anyone who preaches about God's love. The constant loss of innocent life and the many wars going on today in Iraq, Syria, and Afghanistan, the horrors inflicted on the Rohingya in Myanmar, the nuclear developments in North Korea, the many wars in Africa, and on and on, can convince us that we are smart to be afraid. There is much to fear. Yet we are here today celebrating belief that we are loved, that all of creation is loved, and that meaningful, hopeful life awaits all. Love casts out fear. Why can't we love? How can we be the new tenants? The authorities in Jerusalem feared that the message that the Prince of Peace preached would displace them. He was crucified. We believe that the Easter event was a victory over evil, the devil, and all fear. Jesus claims in this parable, at least as it is situated in Matthew, to be the Son of God. 
This struck fear in the hearts of those who had something to lose if he was right. They react with violence. They were, of course, wrong. It was the Romans they pandered to whom they should have feared. We have to dare to live as if we are loved no matter what evil tells us. If perfect love casts out fear, then being afraid makes it difficult, if not impossible, for us to recognize the love. We are called to be absurd and dare to love so that we see this violent world as peopled by people for whom Christ died and love all of them and fear none. Fear, even when rational, can never be a Christian response. The only faithful response is love, and love is not armed. <laughs>